Hello. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here talking about Hawk. Um, this was a signature scheme built with these exceptional co-authors, some of whom are in the room. Now, um, Hawk is in some sense a new kind of signature scheme. It doesn't have so many antecedents. I would say that its two main ancestors are this lattice isomorphism problem framework of Dukat and Van Verden, and also we steal a little bit from Falcon. We steal their code base and we steal their good work on solving the Andrew equation more quickly. But really the, the main ancestor is this lattice isomorphism problem framework, which is quite a general framework for building things like chems and in particular signatures. And I'm going to spend the majority of this talk actually explaining how one might build a signature from such a thing. Um, and just to say that we, we take this framework, which is elegant and beautiful, and in Hawk we really try and like smash it to be as small as it can possibly be while still being plausibly secure. So in particular, we instantiate it over a very simple lattice. We add module structure where there was none before. We simplify the signing and all of this. Um, and these simplifications, they unfortunately come at some theoretical costs. So this is our sort of uh, theoretical uh, pipeline, if you will. In the middle, you have the strong existential and forgeability of Hawk. Um, and on the left, I haven't told you what this problem is yet, but if you solve something called the search module lip problem, you can recover the secret key. And if you can break this existential unforgeability of Hawk, then you can solve this so-called one more short vector problem. Um, and these asterisks are here because um, our simplifications mean that this doesn't really fit into the framework of Dukat and Van Verden. In particular, this one more short vector problem is introduced in Hawk so that we have a concrete target for cryptanalysis. It's something that's not been seen before. But kind of throughout our designing of Hawk, uh, we took the rationale that these formal reductions tell us our design is sane, uh, but we unapologetically set our parameters via experimental cryptanalysis. Now, we wouldn't make these simplifications that cause us such theoretical headaches if we didn't gain anything from them. Um, and what we do gain at the end is some isochronous signature scheme that doesn't have any floating points, and that is, um, I would say, rather fast. Of course, what is fast is application-specific, but uh, this is on par with some of the faster signature schemes. And the public key size and the signature size are similar to, say, Falcon. And one nice extra thing we get in Hawk is that its RAM usage is quite small. For example, our NIST level 1 parameters can fit in 16 kilobytes. But that's enough about the actual performance of Hawk, etc. I want to explain to you how it works by analogy to something that I hope more people are familiar with, which is, uh, say, a more conventional lattice-based hash and sign signature such as Falcon. So the framework we have here is in key generation you sample some lattice alongside a trapdoor. So this is, you know, the entry trapdoor of these small elements F and G usually. You release some public description of the lattice via a bad basis. And then when you want to make a signature, you hash this message to some point in your ambient space and you use the trapdoor to find a close vector. And then when you want to verify it, you verify indeed that this vector from your lattice is close and that it's in the lattice. So. This is a very powerful framework for creating signatures, but if you were to pick one problem with it, it would be that this fourth step where you sample a nearby lattice vector um, can be quite complicated sometimes. And one of the reasons it's quite complicated is because it has to work for any lattice that you generate and any trapdoor that you generate in the key generation step. And so if you were daydreaming one day about how you would fix this problem, you might think, well, what if I could just fix a lattice, some very simple lattice that I can sample from that has nice properties, whatever nice properties mean. Um, but it doesn't really make sense in this framework because if you were to fix a lattice in key gen, then there's no randomness in key gen, everybody knows the secret, etc. But we really want to do this. And so to do this, uh, we need a new perspective. And that new perspective is exactly this lattice isomorphism framework. So, 
The intuition of this framework is put the randomness not in the lattice, but instead in a rotation of the lattice. So in the conventional setting, you have a good basis on the left and a bad basis on the right. Yada yada, the bad basis has got long vectors and they're not orthogonal. But if I tell you that my fixed lattice is the integer lattice, then you laugh at me and tell me I know a good basis, right? So instead, what you do as well is you add a rotation. So now there's some good basis of the integer lattice, but your bad basis is a unimodular on the left, or, sorry, on the right, so a different basis of the integers, and then you rotate it. And even though you know this good basis, you no longer know how to sort of hold it. You no longer have to know how to move between the bad and good basis. And this is precisely what the lattice isomorphism problem is. So you're given two bases that define isomorphic lattices, i.e. one lattice is a rotation of the other, and you have to find both the rotation and this unimodular U. Um, okay, so we have a problem, perhaps we can build some cryptography from it, but there's already somehow a big red flag. Uh, we have solved one problem and introduced another. Now we have this space of orthogonal rotations. This is huge, even bigger than the space of unimodular matrices. It contains transcendental numbers. How on earth do you sample uniformly from it? All of the usual kinds of problems. But uh, we can avoid this by going to something called the gram setting. So if you take a matrix, then its gram matrix is uh, say b goes to q, it's b transpose b. And if you apply this to the formulation of the lattice isomorphism problem at the top, and you do some algebra, lots of stuff cancels, uh, and you find that the gram matrix of b prime is u transpose the gram matrix of b times u. And we neaten all of this up and put this version of the lattice isomorphism problem down at the bottom. And somehow we've sidestepped this horrible issue of having a real valued rotation. So this is the problem we're going to try and build a signature scheme from. Okay. So we're going to have this square brackets represent the equivalence class of all um, isomorphic gram matrices. And notice that this uh, search problem that I define at the bottom here is within such a class. And in particular, we want to use the integer lattice Zn, so this class becomes quite simple. It just becomes unimodular matrices times unimodular matrices. And my idea is to replace the key gen by sampling some unimodular matrix. I haven't told you how. Having that as your trapdoor and letting this gram matrix be the public information. And I want to point out here that recovering this trapdoor U is then exactly this search lattice isomorphism problem. Okay. So we're beginning to rebuild a signature scheme in LIP. We had randomly sam sample a lattice with a trapdoor before, and now we have randomly sample an element from this class, and the trapdoor is the unimodular matrix. And then when you want to release some public information, you release uh, the gram matrix Q. Okay, so how do we sign? Um, something that's often said about this gram matrix formulation is that it sort of keeps the geometry of the lattice but forgets its embedding. And one of the things that this means is if you look at lattice vectors of this lambda u, you can represent them by their integer coordinates. So what do I mean by this? Each such q defines a norm. So usually this norm would just be W transpose W, but here you plop the Q in the middle. And if you have a lattice vector X, so this is <clears throat> some integer vector W times U, then the Euclidean norm of X, if you do the algebra, is just the norm of this W under Q. And it's exactly the knowledge of this unimodular U that lets us move between these two worlds. So when we want to sign, we hash a message to the target in ambient space, just like every other lattice-based hash and sign signature. Um, here we choose zero and a half, because if we hashed it into the integers, it would represent a lattice vector, so we hash it into the next most simple thing. And then we have to figure out a way of using our trapdoor U to sample something short in the same coset. 
So how do we do this? Well, we first sample a lattice vector x from some discrete Gaussian distribution. Exactly how this works is unimportant for the moment, but all you need to know is that it has support Zn plus uh. And then we, so we can form uh because we know the trapdoor u, and then we can form w because again, we know the trapdoor u. And by construction, this w will fall in the correct coset and then return the salt and w. And that's the entire signature. And here is kind of the wonder of this whole formulation is that before I mentioned with Falcon, we had this terrible problem, well, not terrible, sorry, but we had this difficult problem where um, the sampling was challenging because it depended on your trapdoor. But here, regardless of our trapdoor, we can always sample from this particular distribution just by looking at two cosets of uh, the integers. And for various reasons of our reductions, it's also very helpful that Z has a small smoothing parameter. So that's how you sign. And then just to finish off the picture, uh, to verify, you need to check the length of a signature and the correctness of coset. And this is just checking the length of W, your signature under Q, and that H and W uh, have an integer difference. And removing a fair amount of technical details, this is the entirety of Hawk. Um, there's some things I haven't told you yet. For example, in key generation, we have to sample this structured U. I have neither told you how to sample it or how to structure it, which is what I'm going to do next. And then I'll finish with a brief description of cryptanalysis. So uh, up to now, this U has just been some integer matrix. Obviously, that's um, going to be rather large. So as is becoming a bit standard in lattice-based cryptography, we choose a rank 2 uh, module lattice over some power of two psychotomic field K. And not to go into all of the details, but this basically just implies a translation from rank two integer lattices to rank two module lattices over this number field. And these unimodular U, they just become invertible elements over the ring of integers and so on and so on. But it's all well and good to say, I want to sample such a U. How do I ensure that this still generates the integer lattice for me? And that's where um, all of the previous work in entry candidates comes in. So uh, in entry schemes, usually when you sign, you have to you sample some first column of your secret basis, lowercase f and g. And then you want to complete this into a basis with, um, with determinant q, where q is some large prime or medium-sized prime, let's say. Uh, but for us, if we take q equals 1, then exactly the same process uh, ensures that we've generated a structured lattice, a uh, structured basis of the integer lattice. And so this is where we steal a lot of work from uh, Falcon. Finally, cryptanalysis. So key recovery, I mentioned earlier, was just the problem of search lip. Uh, and this is exactly a lattice reduction problem. You want to take your public gram matrix and perform lattice reduction on it until you return the identity. Uh, in particular, if you're going to do lattice reduction on something and get the identity, you have to have at least one vector of length one. And this is the experiment that we do. So this graph, um, we can't sample Hawk keys um, for non-powers of two because they're only defined over power of two psychotomics. So we revert to a sort of unstructured case for non-powers of two. But uh, yes, we we sample very many Q for lots of different dimensions and just perform the lattice reduction and see the block size, uh, progressive block size required to solve the instance. That's these red uh, pieces of data with error bars. And we have various ways from the literature of determining the expected block size, the blue line and also the dashed line. And we can see that we seem to understand the required block size rather well. Um, for signature forgery, it's equivalent to finding some integer vector, which would have been H minus W in the honest signatures, that's close to H under this norm Q. And if you jump through all of the hoops and return this to a lattice problem, it's exactly an approximate CVP instance. And we estimate the complexity of this in the same way that, say, Falcon do, which is implicitly using the nearest co-lattice algorithm of Espito and Kirchner. And then both of these give us block sizes, and then there's a standard pipeline of 
you know, applying the dimensions for free technique and arguing about how one converts a block size into a number of gates and then arguing that you satisfy the number of gates in this one, all of this, right? Um, and we have a fair amount of headway. Um, yeah, and I think that's where I'm going to end. Here are some lovely pictures of a hawk looking rather studious in Oxford, uh, and I'll happily take any questions. <laughs>